everybody, welcome back to another episode of Card Talk, a podcast where we spend a little bit of time talking about cards from Lord of the Rings, the card game. And I'm your host, Dave Walsh. And I'm Grant Thompson, just along for the ride. And today, I have reached the pinnacle of my own life right now. I feel very proud and happy. Um, I'm almost out of my tree stand. Uh, <laughs> uh, to be able to introduce to everybody... Um, a special guest, Caleb Grace, who I believe your official title, Caleb, is lead game designer, right? Lead designer of the game? Like, what's your official title? Uh, my official title is The Dark Knight. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> no, my, my official work title is uh, ca uh, card game developer, LCG developer, um, but I often get credit as like lead developer for Lord of the Rings. Okay. So does that mean you work on solely Lord of the Rings or primarily Lord of the Rings and dabble in other stuff or I've been I've been primarily on Lord of the Rings for the last seven years. Seven years. Um before we talk a little bit about the game, let's get to know who you are. I mean, here we have Caleb Grace. How often does Caleb Grace well actually I would say that you make yourself really accessible for a lot of the players of the game. You're in the you're in the forums a lot, you're on the Facebook group, like you you and you've hosted you've been a part of other podcasts and things like that for the game so i mean you're really into it so um people probably know you more than they know other game developers and game designers so that's that's really cool yeah anyways my question is a lot of people know you as the lead game designer of the game the, the lord of the rings guru right so nate french mm -hmm. designed the game originated the game but i'm sure that you had a life before you were a game designer and i wanted to no, no? <laughs> you were born no, yeah, you were I'm born really unto the game designer <laughs> thing right so what did you do before you came to fantasy flight or to asmodee or i was a teacher you were a teacher. Uh, teacher yeah teacher and a youth pastor okay what did you yeah. teach uh, my background was English, but with the state of education in the United States and the lack of availability of jobs, I just taught whatever I could get. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Were you always in the Minnesota area? Yeah, yeah born and, and raised in Duluth, Minnesota, okay. which is right on the very tip of Lake Superior. And um, I was actually living there right before this job. I, I moved away for college. I lived in the Twin Cities for a while and moved back to Duluth and then back to the Twin Cities now that I got hired at FFG. Okay. So you're kind of a local boy then. A little bit. I, I like to think that I've traveled a lot, seen a lot of the world, to so try to, you know, mm -hmm. get outside of Minnesota, outside the United States, gain some perspective. But, yeah, as, as a kid, I always thought, like, Duluth was so boring and I couldn't wait to leave and see the world. And then something about, like, turning 30 and having a family. And I was like, you know, Duluth's a really great place to raise kids. Right, right. It didn't do so badly for me, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's what ends up happening a lot of times. People just turn around and, you know, they long for where they grew up. So mm -hmm. I totally get that. So what is your, um, when did your love of Lord of the Rings start? I, feel, I, I guess I should ask you if you love Lord of the Rings, but I guess I know the answer to that. You know, but <laughs> I assume at some point you loved Lord of the Rings and you fell in love with kind of the books and lore. The the mm -hmm. the um, what do I want to say? The, the 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 rumors that I've heard is that you just love everything Lord of the Rings. So when did that start? Pretty near. I'm I'm just really a big fan of the books. Um, I discovered The Hobbit when I was in elementary school. Okay. Um, and it's kind of amazing to me to look back and realize, like, I just picked that book up off the shelf, like, all by myself as a kid. Uh, I think I think it was Tolkien's original cover, and there was, like, a little dragon in the background, and I was like, huh, what's that? I started reading, and I just got totally engrossed in it, and uh, I should say it's kind of a, it's a big deal for me because I'm a very slow reader. I, like, read every word, you know? <laughs> Um, so getting getting through a book, especially as a young person, was uh, was a real investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved The Hobbit so much that I ended up reading it like back to back, maybe five times in a row or something wow. crazy like wow. that. Because I didn't know there were more. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, being at a uh, family Christmas or something and just expressing my love for this Middle Earth to, uh, I think, my uncle. And he was like, well, have you read... Uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and I was like, "There's more." What? <laughs> yeah, but wait, there's more. Order now. And yeah. You get oh three my gosh. And, and of, yeah, and of course, I love those books even more than The Hobbit. And then I discovered 
the Silmarillion and, and read all of that. I think I read everything, like all of the stories that Tolkien had written by the time I was like 14. And then, and then all of a sudden you have this, this job that kind of rolls into this sort of thing. So have you found your love growing or waning or changing or how has your love of Tolkien kind of modified as you have this job where you're immersed in it practically every day? Yeah, I, I'm grateful every day that I get to play in Middle Earth. You know, I get to live in this world that Tolkien created and it's just like I didn't know that this was my dream job till I got it. And then I was like, this is amazing. Like all my my nerdy fanaticism about Lord of the Rings has turned into a job asset. <laughs> right. Well I was gonna never say, thought that would happen. Um I mean it's gotta be awesome that you get to create not that you're creating parts of Middle Earth, but you're kind of expanding on some things that were not so detailed. You know, like right. I think of the um, the the Haradrim cycle, you know, like mm -hmm. all of that, just there wasn't a lot in any of the lore about Herod and the, you know, yeah. and all those areas. So I don't it's know. exciting, but it's also like a little nerve wracking, you know, like, um, I, obviously, I have a lot of reverence for the books. And so in that sense, it's exciting. And it's also a little intimidating to like, especially if I'm writing about characters that exist. Like, I think with the Lost Realm, I was writing lines of dialogue for like Aragorn or Elrond. And I was like, oh, man, I better better make sure it sounds like them, you know? Right. Well, I was uh, and maybe this is something a little too crazy, but. I mean, you guys, the, the company, the business side of it, you guys have a deal with Middle Earth Enterprises, right? So a lot yeah. of your stuff has to go through them and get approved? Or, yep. like, how does that process, I mean... Work? Yeah, they're fantastic partners. They, they, uh, they have the rights to The Hobbit and mm -hmm. The Lord of the Rings books. And so everything we do, we have our own internal review process and our own um, standards that every product has to meet. And when we're happy with the product, then we send it to Middle Earth Enterprise and they have a period of time with which to review it. And uh, most of the time it's just thumbs up, great work, you know, this is good. Uh, every now and then they'll have a question about maybe something that we invented. Right. That they'll be like, um, is this a character that's in the books or is this someone you made up? Like, where did this come from? And uh, even then it's usually just a quick, yep, this is a character we made up for the story. And they go, okay, that's cool. Um, there's only been a couple of times that they've even really pumped the brakes and said, mm, hang on a second. <laughs> Let me talk a little bit about some of the some of the design process. So as a designer and of the game, what do you find is kind of the most rewarding part of the design process? Um, I think one of my favorite things as a designer is when I can come up with a mechanic that is new and exciting, but also feels really representative of some uh, theme from the books. So that's, that's always my goal when I'm developing off an intellectual property that's so well loved is to, to kind of be like, you know, who is this character and what are they most known for? And how can I represent that in a way that plays to the strengths of the card game? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there, we, we try for it with every card and some cards, I feel like we really hit it out of the park and that's, that's the really satisfying moment where it's like, right. oh, this is so Eowyn, you know, or this, this is totally right. Bomber counts as two. That's awesome. <laughs> like, it still makes me laugh. That's always kind of funny. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. like Haldir, I think, I think that, um, when we had Chad, uh, Chad Garlinghouse on the show, he talked about mm -hmm. how. Um, Haldir of Lorien, the hero Haldir, is a, yeah, yeah. is a is a home run in terms of what he does in his mechanics. Mm -hmm. Kind of match what he should be doing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What 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 were? Can you think of a card that was kind of a miss? Not that you want uh, to talk about some of those misses, but you know, I'll put you on the no, spot a little okay. bit. No, it's okay. Like so, like I said, I've been on the game for seven years, and prior to that, I had no um professional you know game design experience so mm -hmm. it's definitely been a learning process for me and i will continue to learn the longer i'm at ffg so i can definitely look back and see things that i go ah yeah i wish i had done that maybe a little different or i certainly would do it different now 
Some of those end up as errata. <laughs> I know people got mixed feelings about that, but right. every once in a while I'm like, whoops, that was, uh, that, that was unintended. Right. But I would think there, there are some cards. I think like one that comes to mind would be like Bard the Bowman. Okay. I love Bard the Bowman. He was my childhood hero, right, from The right. Hobbit. Like, killed the dragon. And so I wanted <laughs> to be really awesome. And uh, and so I, I thought, boy, you know it would be really cool is if he was like three printed attack, but it was actually more. And so it's like, oh, he makes the enemy minus two if he's making a ranged attack. And I'm not, I don't regret that like it's bad. It was more just that it didn't help him to defeat Smog. Because right. <laughs> smog, Smog's immune to player card effects. He kind of has right. to be. Right. And so I'm like, doggone it, Bart's ability does not work against the dragon <laughs> right. that he killed. And I really should have seen that coming. <laughs> right. One of the questions that the community had that I thought was really good was, of the player cards, is there one or a couple that's just really hard to design around because the play, because it's so good and you're like, ah, that Steward of Gondor and those two extra resources that I always have to worry about, you know, like as a designer, you know, like, cause you're, yeah, I essence, feel like that question, that question's really about like, so how hard does test a will make your job? <laughs> right, 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 right. Like, and, and because you can't throw into every card immune to player card effects. Right. No, you know, no like, absolutely not. In you know, fact, uh, I think there was a time early on when I first started and Lucas was sort of wrapping up his tenure on the game. Right around that time, there was kind of this this urge to put cannot be canceled on different cards. And I I think since then we found more nuanced ways to do it that, that are – like that was kind of the low-hanging fruit, like kind of heavy-handed approach. Right. And, uh, and it was appropriate at times but not necessarily exciting. And I think we found ways to do it a little better sense. Um, but as far as like, are there cards that I'm like, oh, that card, you know? Yeah. Not, not exactly. Um, I know a lot of people will carry on about Steward of Gondor, um, and and also in, in both will. in both directions. Like, I'm not a huge fan of Steward of Gondor. Yeah. He never like Steward of Gondor doesn't make it in every single player deck that I ever make. You I know, think but, it's fair to say that we wouldn't design those cards the way they are now. Right. Like, if we were to make a card like Test of Will now, it would at least be two cost or have some other restriction. Mm -hmm. um, but what's important to remember about those cards is that they were made uh, in in the core set. Right. That that was it. You have to, to really be fair to those cards, you have to evaluate them in the context that they were created at the time. They were made for a core set, and they were vital to that core set experience. Right. Because if you try playing through that core set with a, one core set, one solo deck, without a test of will right you know like without yeah. Stuart of gondor right. like you're in a world of hurt there there you go card talk fans yeah caleb's throwing down the gauntlet <laughs> <laughs> try to make it through the course i mean i i still have not beaten escape from dogal i think i think of all the the cards like a test of will is definitely the one that i have to keep in mind the most when i'm designing scenarios because it's just so powerful when you consider for one cost if it's a treachery with just a win revealed, you, you've canceled an entire reveal. That's right. something that normally you'd have to pay like three for with Gildor's Council or something like that. Right. But you can do it so cost effective for just one. So you probably notice if you've been following the game for any length of time that a lot of scenarios will have like a, a location or a quest stage or an enemy or something that's going to respond to you trying to cancel a win revealed or something that will just straight up prevent you from being able to do that right while this and, location things can't be yeah. canceled or something right yeah and so i I've, I've actually tried to be real careful i don't fall into a rut of putting those in every single adventure right. <laughs> because it's tempting right i come up with all these great win revealed effects i want you to face them let me ask you one more longer question and then we'll get into some of the some of the rapid fire questions and then we'll sure. and then we'll get into your card. Okay, so sounds good. Um, I know that there's things you can't talk about, and that's that's totally fine. And not that that's not what I'm asking for this question, but just in a mm -hmm. general philosophy, like where is the game going? The game doesn't appear to be dying. Like that's let me let's put that out there right you now. So, have not been reading the forums. Right. <laughs> I have been reading the forums, <laughs> and I am trying to quelch all of those rumors 
right now. <laughs> but so, so I thought everything I read on the internet was true, 100%. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it is, except for that. <laughs> so, but where is the game going? You know? I guess I feel like there's a couple different ways to interpret that question. Like one is maybe mechanics wise, the other one sure. is like story wise, yeah. right? Yeah, sure. Whatever you feel I comfortable. Think, you know, I can't really spoil either. Um, <laughs> I can tell you a little about like story wise and kind of tell you our approach, you know, sure, basically sure. pick a region on the map we haven't been to yet and try to come up with a really nice nine part story in, in that area. Back to the back to the, you know, where the game is going, you know, again, I get mm -hmm. it. pick a place on the map. You know, that's where we're going, you know, mm -hmm. um, but you also said maybe mechanics wise, you know, we're going to see further development of same mechanics. Are we going to see some yeah. new? I think, I think it's a little bit of both. Like you want, you want, um, you always want something new. Mm -hmm. cause you you want to feel like it's, it's growing and there's always surprises for players. There's always a new way to play the game with every cycle. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then you also want to be able to kind of sprinkle in some love for uh, existing strategies so that people feel like, yeah, I just really like this deck and I could do something new for it and it breathes new life into that archetype. Okay. Well, that's about, that's, 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 that's good enough, I guess. I, I mean, I won't, that's like I said, I, I won't, yeah, I know, I know, I can't push you much more, you know. I would love to have you back, so I don't want to, I don't want to keep, <laughs> keep pushing you. Okay, so do you mind doing like a real quick, uh, like quick answer, like rapid fire question? Yeah, give me your best shot. Okay, so it's, I have about I have about fifteen of these. Okay. All right. So it's a healthy number. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's quick, so hopefully it's not going to go very long. Okay. So I assume you play the, the before we get started. You play the game that you design, correct? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I know that you go to Gen Con and you're at Con of the Rings, so there was a lot of mm -hmm. you know, and you interact with people there. Okay. So first question: Do you use tokens or dice? I still use my corset tokens. Okay. And and sometimes I use dice. Okay. Uh, favorite encounter deck mechanic. Oh jeez. I know it's supposed to be rapid fire, but I'm like, uh, favorite encounter deck mechanic. Yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna go with the the cult of the new. I really like the the new competitive format, and I love when the opposing team gets to choose. Okay. Um, favorite favorite Tolkien race. Uh, Dunedain. Favorite sphere? Probably leadership. Okay. Ferret, favorite spirit attachment? Favorite spirit attachment, <laughs> but it's very specific. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. And Grant can verify this. Before you got on, I actually asked. I, Grant was like, why don't you just ask favorite attachment? And I said, because I want to see I want to see the wheels turn when I ask him spirit <laughs> attachment. When he's like, due to Dane Mark. Wait, no, that's not spirit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just funny because uh, when I think of uh, spheres for their different attachments, I don't tend to th like spirit would be like the last one that I would think of for attachments. Now you know why I asked um, about spirit attachments. <laughs> yeah, let's just say uh, King of Dale. King of Dale. Okay, again, cult of the new, right? Um, <laughs> favorite leadership event. Oh, that's sneak attack, easy. Okay, okay. I I'm still love it. I've been seven years playing the game, and I still love sneak attack. Wild Stallion, inspired by Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, or not? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. That one is, uh, that one's all for Nate. Nate is a huge, huge Bill and Ted's fan. Le you know, quick aside, he actually installed like the Bill and Ted like sound effects app on his phone so that he could just push a button and be like, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> or, great. or if he really likes something, there's another button for that guitar. Like, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, favorite beverage. Uh, everyone knows it's Mountain Dew. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Um, clarifying. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, the, 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 the. Surge, love it or hate it? Uh, it has its purpose. I support it. Okay. <laughs> Thallion, is that you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm very excited about that one. <laughs> okay. And is your nickname The Lion? Is that... Or was the Lion. Is that... Actually, um... The Thalion is Sindarin for steadfast, okay. and uh, and my name Caleb is also like it's like a Hebrew name that essentially means steadfast. Okay. 
So that was like trying to name myself in the game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then lastly, favorite scenario. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to go with Cult in the New again. I'm going to say like the Woodland Realm slash Wizard's Quest, the adventures in Mirkwood, oh, custom scenario stuff. It's not Celebrimbor's secret? <laughs> That's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, do you know why I ask if it's Celebrimbor's secret? Oh, because we're going to talk about my uh, my card today. Yeah. So, yeah. so see the see the segue that I have here. You know, like you I, I I worked for th at thirty minutes trying to come up with that segue. I'm like <laughs> rapid fire here. Okay. So, so Caleb, we brought you on the show to talk to you because you're the lead game designer, but you're also a fan of the game that you've created, and mm -hmm. you've. Um, game that just, I work on. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, okay, right. You had, you didn't create yeah. the game. I'm sorry, um, but that's you're okay. You're definitely um, a leading force behind the game. But um, we wanted you. This is card talk, and yeah. we spend a little bit of time talking about cards from the game. So why don't you talk about? Why don't you introduce the card that you chose to talk about here? There was one card at the top of my list. I was actually a little surprised you guys hadn't covered yet, and that was uh, Hero Galadriel. Hero Gladriel, okay. Yeah, that's that's another favorite of mine. And I thought, I was also kind of thinking about cards that would be interesting to talk about. Okay. And I think she's a very interesting hero besides. Yeah, so what, can you can you read down or do you know what, like, who she is or what she is there? Do you have the card in front of you? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have this one memorized. <laughs> so, okay. Oh, uh, you know, I just yeah. wanted to ask. So. No, I don't have everyone memorized, okay. but this one, this one, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, she's a spirit hero. She has the Noldor and the Noble traits, mm -hmm. and she has four willpower and zero attack and zero defense. Now, I think she's got four hit points. That's true. Uh, but, she's, but she's nine threat cost, and, and so that's kind of... That's kind of unique because most heroes, their threat cost is the sum of their stats. Right. And uh, I had a lot of fun designing her because right away, you know, you're like, wow, she's nine for only eight stats. She must be amazing. And the first line of her text is she cannot she can't do quest, attack, right. or defend. And you're like, okay, what? Come again? Like she's yeah, overcosted right. and she can't do anything? Like what's going on? Right. Um, but then you keep reading and you're like, wait a minute now, this is getting good. Right. So she has this passive effect that says allies do not exhaust a quest the turn they enter play. Sorry, all allies that you control. Right. And then she has another great action ability to once per round, I can exhaust her to choose a player and that player reduces their threat by one and draws one card. Right. And so there's a lot going on with this card. I was going to say, and that, I think, and you can verify this or not, but I always think that if you can reduce your threat, you know, then that's where that extra one threat cost comes from, is, you know, the mm -hmm. eight because of the attributes and then the one because of of this. I don't know who was designing Bilbo, you know, who's way over mm -hmm. and get to draw two cards. And so, but this I think fits kind of the mold of what I imagine a yeah. card should be. I mean, there's some low-hanging fruit to talk about. One of the things that we do like to talk about is what pairs well or how to play the card. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's pretty obvious that you know Nenya, Galadriel's Mirror, you know, the Silver Harp, these sorts of things play with her, play yeah. well with her. Um, but what, what are, what could we be missing as players? Like, what kind of cards? Should we be playing with Galadriel, or what? What works really nicely with her? Oh, well, I don't. I don't know if people are necessarily missing anything. I don't know that I put any other secret combos out there that I was like, I wonder if they'll discover. But I think what I like about Galadriel is her versatility. Um, like you said, there there are some low hanging fruit in terms of combos. She came out along with the Sylvan archetype, mm -hmm. and uh, even though she isn't Sylvan herself. You know, she is. Uh, she really works well with them. That they want to enter play a lot, mm -hmm. so that you're always playing them, trying to get them back, play them again. And every time that you do, she allows them to quest without exhausting, um, which is great because again, her husband is Celeborn, mm -hmm. and Celeborn's you know boosting those Sylvans every time they come in, giving them plus one will, plus one attack, plus one defense. So the the you know there's a strong pairing between Celeborn and Galadriel where the allies interplay they get boosted and because they're not exhausting the quest they're getting to make use of the stats right on down the line. 
So they're not just getting used to the enhanced willpower. They might also attack or defend. Um, so that's like the real obvious one, I think. Right. Uh, but what I like about Galadriel is that she's not limited to that deck. Like Celeborn's uh, definitely more niche, right? Like you oh, take Celeborn out of a Sylvan deck. Yeah, and you don't have a he, Sylvan deck. He's not, he's not doing a lot. It's like taking Dane out of a Dwarf deck. He's not doing anything else. Right. It's Whereas Galadriel, Hirluin. you're taking Hirluin yeah. out of an Outlands deck, right? <laughs> right. And I didn't, I didn't want to design Galadriel that way, even though, in the Lord of the Rings, you know, she's mostly associated with the Sylvan Elves of Lorien. She's also a member of the White Council. She's a real inspiration for the Fellowship. Um, so I really like the idea of a support hero, uh, you know, someone who's she's not, she doesn't leave Lorien to go off on an adventure at this point in the story instead she's an inspiration for some and um yeah real support for others where uh, that's where the you know not exhausting the quest comes from mm -hmm. um she's a real she's a real leader in that sense that she's like motivating these people to go out and do their thing but then also she has a lot of wisdom to impart so that was kind of that's the card draw right. you know, she's sharing the wisdom but also the inspiration and the elf magic to reduce your threat mm -hmm. um so that fits into a lot of different decks. That's what I like. I always love seeing her in multiplayer. That's kind of another fun element. So, some heroes are like better in solo, and right. some are better in multiplayer. And Gladio's like, I think good in both. She's very versatile that way. Yeah, I I agree. And and the thing that I like about Galadriel is, is what you said is is she's versatile. Like, you know, you get these heroes that are really like super niche, and you need to use them in the in the specific deck. So, okay, Celeborn, you have to use in a Sylvan deck. Um, mm -hmm. But the but the amount of the amount of things that you can pair Galadriel with is mm -hmm. is just crazy. You can you can use her in everything from a Hobbit deck to like a Tactics deck to get mm -hmm. that extra quest. You know, like and and that's mm -hmm. uh, Rings DB with all the different ring the decks that are out there like they're just filled with different varieties of decks that you can use so so grant you've been talky talky all night long are you still awake <laughs> yes i'm still awake okay you're here for the ride so yeah, no but I'm just along for the ride, yeah so but what do you th what do you think of galadriel what are what what's what's your hot take well in all honesty, um, I was I dropped off the map of Lord of the Rings um, after the book of Isengard um, came out, and just before the written character expansion started to come out. I then obviously came back towards the end of the Dream Chaser cycle, and when I was looking through most of the cards that I'd missed, the one that and um, Gladrill was like, wow, really? Because doing um, so little to quest, but she's got this unique ability that doesn't allow her to, uh, doesn't allow allies to enforce to commit to the quest, but then she can also give you threat reduction and to draw a card. And then it wasn't until I actually started looking, well, you can actually send that to quest with uh, men. So for the world. And it's right, she's very versatile, and it doesn't actually, it can be any deck that you want to be played with, it still fits in, or you really need to build a deck around it, or a rate of inches there, and it works well. Um, obviously, I sent the link earlier on to a um, deck that I saw on Rings TV the other day, um, the Gilf deck. The Gilf deck. Which was just a two pair, um, a two hero deck, um, which was Arwen and Galadriel. And I was running to test out, and it works actually quite well. Um, but again, it's a deck that 
She could fit in anything, and I actually enjoyed playing with her. Actually, uh, fun little anecdote. Uh, since I complimented Jeremy Zwern earlier, I can poke fun at him a little here because it's not really. I, I just remember he was playtesting for me at the time. He, he's been like helping out at FFG for way longer than he's been uh, working on the team. And uh, I think part of the reason he got hired is because he was helping everybody play test. He was he was so integral to like all of the games that we were developing. And uh, I remember around the time that we were doing this set he sent me an email and he was like super polite about it he didn't want to like call it out on the forums and be like i think you're way off so he actually like emailed me privately and he was like i i don't he's like i don't know if i would play galadriel like she's she's like the same cost as aon but aon can just commit to the quest for four willpower and not only that but i can throw a card and make her five and in a multiplayer she can be all the way up to eight like I'm just worried that Galadriel's a big deal and, and no one's going to play her because she can't quest or attack or do anything. And, um, and, and it was like, well, if, you know, if Jeremy's telling me this, I got to really think about it because he really is like a, a diehard tester and he's got a lot of good insight. And I remember I just kind of had to like stick to my guns and I was like, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure she fits the role that she needs to fit. And uh, so when she came out, she was pretty well received. And I think, uh, you referenced some of those polls or ratings that people have done for for different heroes and cards. The FFG forums used to have this, like, you know, top hero poll, like, annually. Mm -hmm. And I remember Galadriel, like, shot up to the top, like, very uh, very near, like, one, like, her in her first year. <laughs> and right. So, so Jeremy sent me uh, sent me an email later going, like, well, I, 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 I guess that's why you're lead developer or something like that. Right. It, was, it was just, it was, I thought it was really nice. It kind of made me chuckle because yeah, I mean, he, he kind of echoed the fears I think that we all had, like it's weird to have a hero that apparently can't do anything. Um, but I just like the intuition was it felt right to have her fill that niche that she fills in the books of being a much more support character. Yeah. And I think that also, and, I think about, this is how totally dorky I'm about the game is because I think also about like what cards you release with what adventure pack, you know, mm -hmm. so because my understanding is that you kind of develop the whole cycle together and then you kind of split it up as things, yep. you know, just to make sure. But I think, you know, releasing Nenya in the same adventure pack as Galadriel and then... That's the only way you could do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then, but then not... Maybe her mirror came out in the same pack too, but then there's like, it did. and yeah. then there's, but then there's the handmaiden, you know, that Galadriel's mm -hmm. handmaiden, which you know, isn't necessary for a deck that runs her, but you know, like that's released a little bit later, and then you're like, oh, here may be another piece to the puzzle that would be good. You know, mm -hmm. like, I think that there's some of that like marketing. That's not really marketing, but it's kind of like. Oh wow! Okay, they're continually thinking about these things, and it's like mm -hmm. a, it's like a throw. It's like a, a shout out to the people who really love to do those things. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things actually about uh, developing the game, is that we develop all the player cards at once. Uh, for so, for example, yeah, yeah. So with with the cycle right now, um, you know, like the the last AP um, gave us the Haldan hero, right? And so we have a a, a brand new woodman archetype of putting attachments on locations and suddenly looking at locations in a different way and go on. and it's really exciting to see how well he's been received and people are building decks with him already it's hard for me because i'm like i know what's coming still <laughs> like, right, I'm, right. I'm really impatient for it to come out because i'm right. like that deck's just gonna get better <laughs> right <laughs> That's what I was just about to say. It sounds like you're saying, "Hold on to your hats, folks, because it's Haldan's about to get some get some help." Yeah, I just think if people are enjoying that deck right now, I think they're gonna have a lot a lot of fun with it by the end. So that's good. I think that Galadriel, though, if we're really taking a deep dive, I mean, Galadriel, in terms of game, in my book, isn't necessarily a top tier hero. Um, oh, see now, now, now we're talking. Right. Let's get into it. You know, well, that's that's <laughs> that's when Grant and I decided to do this. That was the thing. You know, let's take a deep dive into a card. You know, like yeah. I think that when you think of top tier heroes, you're thinking, um, well, Grant, what are like Sam? Sam, we both agree is a top tier hero. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
you know, Spirit Eowyn, even Tactics Eowyn, like those cards, I feel like, you know, those are the go-to cards. Spirit Glorfindel, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but I think Galadriel, while is a great hero, I don't, I don't necessarily turn to her all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, because, like I said, she makes you think about the game in a whole different way. And sometimes, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What do well, you you're say not, not going to run her in a deck that doesn't use a lot of allies, that's for sure. <laughs> like, if you, if you were trying to build, like, a tactics, you know, just load up my heroes with attachments and kill things, yeah, she like a she Bell. might help that deck a little. <laughs> right. Yeah. right, and I think that the other consideration with her is that get, to make her effective, you're also using up more card slots than you would in a normal in, for a normal hero. When you're running a Galadriel in your deck, you need Nenya and you need the mirror. You know, you don't need the Silver Most Harp. The well, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because I actually, um, of course I designed the mirror, but I find that like I never use it. I hate discarding that card. <laughs> That's just my play style. I'm like, it's such a cool ability because the, thematically it's like, some of these things might happen and some of them might never come to pass. And that's like, when you discard that card, it's like, I guess it's never going to come to pass. Yeah. <laughs> and it's such a feel bad moment for me personally, but it, it was the right ability for the card. So I don't actually tend to use that when I use Galadriel. I, I, of course I throw a ring in, but if I'm, if I'm using Galadriel, the ring is like icing on the cake. The real reason I have her in there is for her ability for that for her, for her yeah for the action advantage like every it, it's basically like you know ready an ally every time you play them so that that's some serious action advantage and i also find being able to reduce your threat by one in a lot of scenarios means my threat will never go above my starting threat right and that card draw is like you just doubled your card draw you know you're drawing 100 percent more cards every turn Right. So that's that to me is like that's that's top tier for me. It that's, just but you're right. It has to be in the right deck. Right, and that's why I think that it's not for me. It's not necessarily top tier. Grant, what do you what are your thoughts about this top tier versus not top tier? Now, now Grant, I'm expecting you to say the right thing. <laughs> yeah. Right, and make sure you speak into the microphone so Caleb doesn't mistake what you're saying. Yeah. No, actually, if you want to back up as far away as you can, I will interpret for you. <laughs> you can just be like mumble, mumble, mumble. Yeah, he just said I completely agree with Caleb. <laughs> Caleb's entirely right. Gladriel, best hero ever. Well, well said, Grant. <laughs> Well, since it is Caleb's fault, I have to agree with Caleb. There you go. <laughs> In all fairness, um, I don't go and say I want to build a deck around Galadriel. She is definitely one of the top ones that I go to for a support hero, mm -hmm. um, but not for a hero that I want to build a deck around and say, right, I'm using Galadriel, who do I pair with that? Uh, beat mm -hmm. But I still think she's a um, I still think she is a very good hero that has a lot of potential in most decks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's fair. I don't, I don't think you have to necessarily build around Galadriel. Like she pairs nicely with people, but I, I do agree yep. with Caleb at least once that you know, like <laughs> she does slot into a lot of different types of decks, and that's always. Mm -hmm. nice. I mean, obviously she's Noldor, and there are a lot of cards specific to Noldor that you, that you could give her and that could trigger off of her. You know, like. Um, like Elrond's council and things like that, you know, like, yeah. but you know, that those are just good cards anyways. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, True. you know, like, I don't know. It's just, when I think of deck building, I just don't, I don't always think Galadriel. No, I think that's actually really, really honest and good feedback. It's like, because as you're saying it, I'm thinking that that's probably true for me too. Like there are heroes that you say, I'm going to build a whole deck around this ability. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's heroes that you're like, this hero just really helps round out this lineup and gives this deck what it needs. I think she's like, you know, she's, she can be a motor that keeps a deck running. You know, there's, there's been a lot of multiplayer games, especially I've played where, um, you know, maybe I'm playing a deck without Galadriel and I'm just short on cards. I'm just not drawing into the combos that I need to really kick it into high gear. And I can ask my teammate across the table, say, uh, hey, can you, can you give me Galadriel's card draw this turn? 
and boy what a difference or other scenarios where uh the threat is starting to push that level of like geez if my threat goes up one more then i have to take that big enemy that's going to crush me do you think you could use galadriel to lower my threat this turn and uh so in that sense she really starts to shine even more in multiplayer well, as, you're, as you're talking about it reminded me that most of the time the way that i play galadriel is i will i will get her ring on her and i won't use her until after the staging step mm -hmm. and at that point i can determine do i need to add her willpower to the quest or should we draw a card and, and reduce threat mm -hmm. and so that's pretty cool too there's not a lot of heroes that can you know most heroes have to commit to the quest at, at a specified right. time so i really like her for that reason too i want to ask this question in mm -hmm. in the politest way I know how here. <laughs> here <it goes. laughs> What's the like jankiest way that you've ever seen Galadriel played? Like, you know, like you, I I assume you see cards like because you, you do play a lot. You're at Gen like you're all over the place. You're playing the game, and so I assume you're like, wow, that's not really what I intended that to you to be used for, but. Okay, you know, like, <laughs> have you ever seen... Well, Gal Galadriel was one of those cards, actually, that I I feel good. I had enough foresight uh, with her, so I actually don't see her get, you know, abused much because I think we put some good stop gaps in there. Like, her action to reduce threat draw card has limit mm -hmm. once per round. Right. And uh, the ring, the ring is the one that I always see people try to abuse, mm -hmm. where they're like, hold on now, I'm going to have Galadriel give this person plus four willpower and then use Herogram to get all that extra attack. And the thing is the, the ring is a quest action. Like that was something that I made sure to add on the ring. It's like, no, no, no. If you're making an attack during the quest phase, sure. But you know, she's not going to let you do that during combat. Well, what else about Galadriel? Is there anything else? Uh, well, I think, I think I've said most of, uh, most of what I think. Uh, although I, I will say it's kind of funny. The whole time we've been talking about this, I realized, that I haven't built Galadriel into a lot of different decks. And I was like, why haven't I? I'm thinking about it. I go, oh, that's right. Because I've had pretty much the same Sylvan deck constructed since the Ringmaker cycle. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's it's kind of like my standby, like, playtest deck. Like, it's a deck that I know is is good, but it's not the best. And, uh, and I found that's, like, that's the kind of deck I want to test scenarios with. To make sure that they're difficult, but not like too insane, you know, depending on what I'm shooting for. Right. So I've actually had the same lineup of Celeborn, Haldir, and Galadriel all the way since the Ringmaker cycle. Uh, what about you, Grant? Is there anything else you want to say before we ring this girl? Um, no, I'm Oh, wait, just ring not... this girl. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just busy putting together uh, Haldan, Grimbion, and um, Galadriel deck. Um, just busy trying to get them to work together. Nice. Uh, coherently, um, because I'll, I've loved Grimby Owen since I uh, saw him spoiled in a site. I so want to play that card. <laughs> and then nice. um, I saw a deck on um, Rings DB that had um, Grimby Owen and Haldan in, and it was like, well, why don't I just slot Galadriel in there? And that gives us a bonus to like the questing power. Mm -hmm. On top of um, being able to defend with Grimby on and attack with him. <laughs> and yeah. then Haldan's there for basically everything else mopping up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm busy building. I started building that earlier on. I've got to finish that off at some point when I'm not working. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of fun mechanics that have come out just recently that I've started to really enjoy um, playing with. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear you like the new stuff. Right. So you want to ring him, David? Ring her, David? Um, but so, Caleb, just so you know, we have this scientific yet totally arbitrary system where we <laughs> ring the cards. Okay. So we have one, one ring, uh, which is the one card to rule them all. Which has... Wait, oh, this is this is to rate the cards. When you said totally arbitrary but scientific, I thought you were talking about the difficulty ratings. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think that's well established that those are totally arbitrary. I think it's like the percentage of rain expected on a day. It's like, you know, it's 70% chance of rain. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, but uh, so we have, a, we have a ringing system where we ring 
the card, and uh, one is the uh, the one card to rule them all, and ten is the trash bin. So, um, Caleb, since you're our guest, we'll let you choose. The, th- the three of us will rate the card, um, even though I'm asking you to like rate your sure. child, right? Um, so do you want to go first, I just second, need to know or third? How, what what rating would be considered the bee's knees? The bee's knees. <laughs> yeah, that would be um, that would be three pi over two. <laughs> I, I will give Gladriel the bee's knees rating. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I think she's really good. Honestly, she's one of those cards that I wouldn't change anything. Uh-huh. So I, I would give her one just because I'm I'm 100% satisfied with the card. See, and it's so that's a little bit more from a design level. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if it's interesting to talk to you about that because, you know, we're only looking at it from a playability, like whatever it is that we're looking at, you know, like yeah. from a design level, I can totally see why you would say one. Uh, so is that your rating? Are you sticking with it? Yep. Oh, geez. Okay. It's the bee's knees. That was pretty. That was pretty easy. So, Grant, I'll let you go second. Well, I enjoyed playing with her. Um, she's a good all-round hero for what she does. I'm giving her a three. A three. Okay. Yeah. And so, one of the things we didn't talk about that I'm going to say here in my ring rating is that her card art is amazing. One of the things mm-hmm. that I love about the game is you guys definitely employ or hire some of the best artists in the game to or in the, in the world to do these to do the art and her art is also amazing yeah um, so I, I that's love magali that. vilnoev yeah. did the art for that one besides her card art though i think that you know like i like i was saying i don't I don't classify her as a top tier hero where I'm always going to consider her as part of a as part of a deck when I'm running Spirit. You know, in the way that I always think of Spirit Glorfindel or Spirit Eowyn as being part of the deck. I love her mechanics. I'm looking forward to her in my in my own version of a Sylvan deck. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna put her at a four. I'm gonna give her four rings because of this. Um, but that doesn't mean you're wrong, Caleb. I want I want to. <laughs> no, it just it just means I like Grant as the better host of yeah. the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, I, I, we're out of time. Basically, you got you've been amazing to spend an hour and a half of your time with us and. You know, it's you know. I know that you have family there playing Legos. Or all sorts <laughs> yeah, of you stuff. can hear them. <laughs> yeah, look at this, Dad. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, like for you to take some time out of your day is just just amazing. And so, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's my treat. This has been a lot of fun chatting with you guys. Um, and if if you enjoy, we'd love to have you back sometime. You know, um, sure. We're always here. We've been around for a while now, and and so we'd love to have you back anytime you have the time everybody join us again for the next episode of card talk have a good night